Good afternoon, everybody. Thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all for coming. My name is Justin. I'm the general manager of Uncle Bobby's. I would love to welcome you all to our sixth annual Radical MLK Symposium. And um, the last one we had in person was in January of 2020. And as everyone knows, not a lot happened after January 2020. But, but no, but it, it, it was a long road to get back to this point, and I'm very grateful for all of us to be healthy, all of us to be happy, and all of us to you know be in community together. And I'm so glad that we're back to bringing back these uh, in-person community events. I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but I do have to say um, and express my gratitude always to the good folks at FUMCOG, because without their partnership, Without them allowing us to use this space, we cannot do the events the way that we do them. We make all of our events accessible to everybody to the best of our ability, and we can't do that unless we have great community partners. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Pastor Elise from FUNCOG, who would like to give her welcome. Oh, and Pastor Gabe. Oh, multiple pastors. Gabe's the one who makes it happen, so I got to start with Gabe. Good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I just want to say that uh, special thanks to Justin, Justin and the Uncle Bobby's crew. It's been so great working with Uncle Bobby's and we're so glad that you could be here. And I hope this is a safe space for everyone to enjoy the show. And just a couple of things I want to mention. Whoever, has, who's been here before? Anyone been in the church before? Okay, for those who have been here, you, you know that getting to the bathroom is a little complex. So uh, we have wonderful church members here to my left that can guide you and help you if you need to go to the bathroom. So other than that, welcome, and please let us, let us know if you need anything. I'll hand it off to Pastor Lisa. It, it also just hit me that we do have coloring bags in the back if any young ones or old ones feel the need to meditate in that way. Those are back there. Um, I, I want to say a, a special, um, every time we gather in this space, we are reminded that no matter where you come from or going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you're feeling or not feeling, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all of who you are is invited into this space to learn and grow. And so we are really honored every time someone comes in and we have such an opportunity. Um, I was thinking about today and tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. we will have a big Dr. King celebration in which we'll be having Beacon Theater. Anyone know Beacon Theater? Shout out to Beacon Theater, they're an amazing local group. Um, they're going to be offering a piece called How the Truth Came Out, about 12 um, women, black civil rights leaders whose stories aren't often told. So they'll be sharing some of their story here. And one of those leaders is named Polly Murray. Anyone know Polly Murray? So yeah, I've just learned about her, yeah. And so uh, we're talking about a civil rights activist who was also a lawyer, worked on gender equality, um, and then became the first African-American Episcopal priest, female black Episcopal priest. Um, so I just want to say this quote as we, as we welcome you all in today. She said, in not a single one of the campaigns, of these little campaigns I took on, was I victorious. In other words, in each case, I personally failed. But I've lived to see the thesis upon which I was operating vindicated. And what I very often say is that I've lived to see my lost causes found. And we are about to hear people who are following up on the leaders who worked and may have felt like they lost it. So, oh, what time does it start? Thank you. I was like, oh, is she telling me I'm talking too long? Because <laughs> I do that. I'm a preacher. Um, it starts at 11 o'clock tomorrow, and then we'll have a big lunch and afterwards. So everyone is welcome. And the last thing I want to mention, for those who live in the Germantown area, right out here is the Germantown Community Fridge. It's really a phenomenal 24-7 fridge, and we're going to be starting a new partnership with them next week. Um, to be cooking individual meals to put in the fridge. So if you want a place to serve in this community right now, let Pastor Gabe Rhino afterwards. We'd love to um, have you participate or drop by the fridge anytime to take or give. I'm done to hand it off to the brilliant minds and um, leaders that are going to teach us today. Thanks so much, Justin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just, uh, you know, one note. As you know, we are a bookstore, and we have books in the back, and we specially curated these books that we felt uh, captured some of the, the more, you know, uh, the full view of uh, Dr. King. 
and the radical nature of Dr. King, which you'll hear a lot more about with this panel. And without further ado, I would like to welcome the owner of Uncle Bobby's and the person hosting and leading the panel, Mark Lamont Hill. Peace, everybody. Free the land. It is such an honor to, uh, to be here again for what is now the sixth, sixth annual Martin Luther King Radical Symposium at Uncle Bobby's. This is, this is such an incredible, incredible joy to be a part of this one more year. When Uncle Bobby's opened, we were committed to being a space where we had community engagement but also community education. We wanted this to be a learning space. We wanted this to be a space where people could get access to traditions and ideas and people who might otherwise not be accessible to our communities or who uh, might be underrepresented in our community. And so one of the first things we said we were gonna do is we gotta do something for Martin Luther King Day. But everybody does something for Martin Luther King Day. So the question was, what would Martin Luther King Day look like for Uncle Bobby's? In the United States, a lot of people think about Martin Luther King Day as a day of service. It's a day where people feel good, that they gave away some canned goods, and gave away their clothes, or worked in a school. All stuff we should do all the time. But the question was, does that represent the legacy of Dr. King? Some people said, this is not a day off but a day on. We can't just sit at home and enjoy the holiday. We got to do something. Again, true. Action is necessary. But for us, the legacy of Dr. King is rooted in the black radical tradition. And as much as people want Dr. King to be uh, a multicultural action figure, as much as people want him to be a passive, docile, toothless preacher, as much as people want Dr. King to be a green screen for whatever people's political ideas are on the right or the left, Dr. King was a radical freedom fighter. That's who he was. And so for us at Uncle Bobby's, we said, what can we do to make sure that the world knows that? What kind of conversation can we put together so that every single person, not just in this community, but around the world, understands that to live in the legacy of Dr. King is to engage the black radical tradition. It is to create a world where the gap between those who have and those who don't is shrunken, and to create a world where the systems and the structures that create injustice are destroyed. We don't just want to put a Band-Aid on problems. The radical tradition says we get to the root, we uproot it, and we do something different. That's what it means, and so every year, at Uncle Bob is we bring together some folk that can help us do that. We bring together some smart people, some brilliant people who think about Dr. King deeply, who think about the world closely, but who also do work in the world that leaves it better than they found it. And that is who is on today's panel for Uncle Bobby's sixth annual MLK Radical Symposium. So give them a round of applause before I even bring them out. Give them a round of applause. And in addition to all of you who are here, and I thank y'all for coming out on a Saturday, we also have many, many people who are watching on Uncle Bobby's YouTube channel. So I will be taking questions from them. I'll be talking to the, to the, to the panelists for, for a bit. As you, they are talking, think about some good questions you have for them. Think about some ideas you want to engage. But make sure you listen to them. Don't come up with questions you already had before you came in. Engage the, the conversation and push forward and ask questions that you want to know when you came in. We're going to do all of that, and we're going to take some questions through YouTube, all right? So with no further ado, I'm done talking for the day. I'd like to bring out our panelists. Uh, let's bring out, first of all, Dr. Jared Ball. He's all the way from Morgan State. You also got to check out our Mix What I Like. You can take this seat on the end here. Up next is the Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan, one of the great visionary leaders in this community at St. Paul's, a brilliant mind and a wonderful preacher. Uh, let's bring in also Dr. Sharice burton Stelly, brilliant scholar. And she came all the way from the Midwest just to be with us. And joining us, he hails from Farmville, Virginia. I like to mention this because him and my mom are from the same place. 
How random is that? From Farmville, Virginia, but he is a professor of African and African American Studies at Columbia University, was once the president of New York Theological Seminary, emeritus right now, and the author of a, a bunch of amazing books, including a book called The Politics of Jesus and Christians Against Christianity. Two amazing books. Give it up for, please, Reverend Dr. Aubrey Hendricks. All right, y'all, so now's the fun part. I started, I don't know if you can hear me, but one of the things I said is in this country, we think and talk about Dr. King in so many fascinating ways, but so many ways that misrepresent who, his, who and what his legacy is. So my question to all of you, and take this where you want, and as they used to tell me at Morehouse, be suitably brief. Who is Dr. King? Who is Martin Luther King Jr.? Why don't we start with Jared and just going around? Sure. Uh, greetings. Can, can we make sure that mic is good? Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's the 10. Okay. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, greetings, everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to have been invited to this conversation. It is something that has uh, been, been very important to me for a long time. And, and given that we're in this space, I think it makes perfect sense that I share with you my one-liner about who I think Dr. King is, which is the most known and least understood human being, maybe since the historical Jesus Christ. So the amount of people that speak and know his name around the world but have absolutely no idea about the kind of revolutionary that Dr. King really was to me is akin to the way others, including Jesus and others, are misrepresented in pop culture and, and beyond. So Dr. King was a radical, he was a revolutionary, he was supportive of all forms of anti-colonial movements here and abroad, he was um, a staunch critic of capitalism, he was, uh, to my own liking, an even more staunch critic of both white liberals and the black bourgeoisie. Uh, areas of his critique that often get ignored in popular representations of him. And he is somebody that would have abhorred, in fact, spoke in his lifetime against the idea of being commemorated as he has been uh, in the mind's eye and in statue down in D.C. So it's, it's an honor to be able to talk uh, in such a space like this uh, about the real Dr. King to a certain extent and remind people just of uh, uh, the kind of revolutionary that he was. Want to join in saying thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, wonderful to be in a space where community education and activism and uh, engagement is happening. So thank you, uh, Mark. And thank you, Uncle Bobby's at large. Um, so I will start with the thing that I think also frequently gets left out um, of conversations about King. And that is, I think Martin Luther King Jr. was a black Baptist pastor. I think that, um, and I think that gets left out um, because both for the religious and the non-religious, the version of pastor and religion and theology and Christian practice that Martin Luther King Jr. espoused doesn't fit the mainstream narrative about what religion is and how it functions. But I think that the thread of Martin Luther King's life and work runs through the Black Baptist Church, both um, in terms of his own formation and his understanding of the world and the faith, and also his deepest commitments, um, first, in his decision to practice pastoring rather than going to academia after he finished his PhD. And then the way that his politics consistently responded to the conditions that the people he pastored faced. Um, and a kind of deepening awareness of what it meant to pastor black people and to both share a 
personally, but also to care about the things they were facing. So I think um, remembering him as a pastor is really important, and that's where I want to start. And we're going to touch back on all of these points. This is great. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I, too, want to thank uh, Mark and Uncle Bobby's uh, for having me and all of you for being here. So for me, I think something that's really important to remember and understand about King was that he was an activist and organizer. He always belonged to organizations, to collectives. He, um, he was a person because of people as we say, right? He was, and so we often, because of the way that history and historiography operate in this country, we just remember him as a great man, as if, as if he was a singular figure. But he was always part of broader collectives, and I think that's really important to understand because people become great by their commitment to the people, right? By their commitment to struggle. Um, and the reason why we know about King and continue to talk about King is because of the legacy maintenance that comes from other people, right? From his wife and his children, but also to um, the scholars and our organic intellectuals and ordinary people who continue to study him and take his work seriously. Um, for me personally, um, I understand Dr. King to be both a theorist and a critic of what we now call racial capitalism um, Mark will make me define terms later. <laughs> He's an anti-imperialist and an analyst of imperialism. And um, he is, you know, he was somebody, I think, who embodies the contradictions of struggling for black liberation and some aspect of economic democracy on the one hand, but uh, acceptance or, or a willingness to work within the system as it is currently, which is, a real contradiction. And so, um, in terms of thinking about the radical king, it's really important to take him on his own terms. Too many people try to make him into a neoliberal or some type of conservative, or even our friends on the left try to make him into like a Bolshevik, and he wasn't. He was none of those things. King was Kingian. And so I think that to take his work seriously is to take him on his own terms and not try to read him into um, intellectual or political traditions to either save him on the one hand or to malign him on the other. Um, he's relevant on his own terms. And I think to take thought and praxis seriously, we really have to engage with ideas and with practice um, as it is and not as we want it to be. Bishop? Man, you know I don't like that. <laughs> I ain't into all that hierarchy stuff. You know that, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. It's so good to be here. And I, um, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm hesitating because I, I don't want to sound like I'm falling, but I'm uh, glad to be here with my brother. Uh, I'm such a fan of his work and his commitment um, and his productivity. I don't know how he does it. TV, he's got his, teaches his class, he's writing, doing documentaries, and then he can he run a bookstore and then have you all here. So I, I think, brother, in many ways, you are a model for what it means to be an academic and organic intellectual, organically tied to uh, the concerns of community. Uh, and Dr. Martin Luther King was also, um, and I, well, he was a, <clears throat> He was an organic intellectual, though he was very deeply um, uh, academically trained. Dr. King uh, was totally focused and committed to the common good. In that sense, he was a man who had a much deeper understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ than, uh, than most people ever do, because he understood that when Jesus said uh, that the most important um, <clears throat> commandment on the social level is to love your neighbor as yourself on the horizontal, that that has such profound, profound implications economically, socially, and politically. Um, and and uh, underlying that profundity is when you say that you, when we're told to love our neighbors as ourselves, we're told to want and to struggle for the same rights, freedom, the same um, 
good, same access to the good things of life as, anyone, as everyone else. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to struggle uh, for our neighbor to have that just the same as we want for our, our own family. And that implies deep structural change if you're going to have deep structural change if you're going to have um, I'm sorry, it threw me off. I didn't. I'm sorry. My son came. This is first MLK day, so I got excited. That's all. I was like, hey. Yeah, I got a little. I'm like, whoa, brother. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's all right. Come on, y'all laugh along with me. I came a long way. <laughs> um, but no, I'm saying that um, that implies structural change. And, and King talked about it. He said we need to. Um, we need to have a revolution of values, and we need to, to, to change the architecture of society. Yes. So King, in that sense, uh, I'd say was, was a revolutionary. And why? Because he had deep socialist uh, sensibilities and commitment sense in, from an early age, which he finally came out with toward the end of uh, toward the end of his life. He even said that there's a big difference. King said there's a big difference between um, reform. And revolution. A lot of people won't talk about that. So this man was a was a was a, a very radical slash revolutionary. He wanted to revolutionary the American political economy from from uh, the dog eat dog selfishness of capitalism to to a more um, biblically oriented socialist ethos. I didn't say social uh, socialism. Socialist ethos, meaning that we're concerned about the common good, which really would have um, revolutionized the whole country if we could have em embraced that, which of course is why he was, was murdered. And I look forward to talking about that. That's who King was. He was a man who had a holistic understanding of the gospel, which meant that he wanted to change this country and the world so that everybody could have the right to eat of the uh, fruit of the tree of life. Okay, so y'all all laid out some important stuff. So I'm gonna I'm I'm throw out the next question. I'm, I'm starting with what Jared said. You, said. you talked to him as the most misunderstood person since Jesus Christ, which that's, that's a heck of a claim. Okay? There's some misunderstood, misunderstood folk out here, right? We in Philadelphia, Ben Simmons, you know, we got a whole bunch of folk, right? Sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow, right. Look, but he is misunderstood. <laughs> but, 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 Jack, help us understand how and why, right? Because you could just be misunderstood because people don't get you. Right. You could be misunderstood because you didn't communicate your, or represent yourself well, or you misrepresented yourself. But there feels like something different about King. I watch Republican conventions for work. I have to. I watch these conventions, and they quote Martin Luther King more than anybody. Then I watch pro-lifers, and they quote Martin Luther King. Then I, wa I can go to a, uh, uh, the... Um, uh, Democratic Socialist uh, Conference. I can, I can go across, I go to Democratic DNC. I go, that, everybody quote Dr. King. That's why I said he's like a green screen. People protect whatever they want, whatever they believe onto him, and it seems to resonate and work. So it seems like to me it's not just that we get him wrong. We get lots of folk wrong, right? But that there seems to be some, maybe like Jesus, some intentionality, and that there might be some structures and systems at play that are very intentional about using King in ways that undermine the very project he was trying to advance. So how do I say why King is misunderstood? So, so I, I love the way you frame that because my point is, is uh, looking at it from the perspective of somebody who does try to study psychological warfare and propaganda, uh, he has been intentionally rebranded. Um, even before he died, there was, there was an attempt to rebrand him. And the fear emanates out of what William C. Sullivan said in defense of the COINTELPRO that was emerging, the counterintelligence program that was emerging in the, uh, underneath the FBI, within the auspices of the FBI, where even for some of us who come to King late with that, with that general myth that he was soft and Malcolm was the revolutionary, uh, from the pr perspective of the state, even after the March on Washington, they were, William Sullivan was already saying, he's the biggest threat, King is the biggest threat in turning the Negro to communism. We already, he was saying, have to get involved in interfering his connection to black people, black youth, and black movements in particular. So from the beginning, beginning, early on, there was an attempt to rebrand him and promote him as somebody he wasn't, whether it was the antithesis to Malcolm X, then Malcolm is assassinated, then they turn King into the man of the year, 
candidate in 1965, and then by 90 days before he's assassinated, the Washington Post in 1968 is saying he's a threat to national security, and his march on Washington that year, that summer, is going to be taken over by Leninists and Stokely Carmichael, another target of the counterintelligence program. So, so King, that's sort of what I mean, that there has been a machinery around disassociating King from radical politics and then green screening him. I really love how you put that. Then he can be green screened. Once you disassociate him from those politics and you stop, even, the, even if you go to the monument in DC, there's only one quote uh, pinned on the wall from post 1966 because that was sort of a break after his Chicago summers and all of that where he get, became more overtly radical. You know, they've, they've literally washed him away as they've represented him and promoted him and propagated him all around the world. And that's why I'm saying there has to be a machinery. You can't just, as you say, be misunderstood as many of us are. You have to, the, the levels I'm talking about require uh, decades, half a century's worth of the, the most uh, uh, powerful propaganda state that the world has ever produced. The United States is the most, has the most the ability to penetrate and, and, and make pervasive its messaging unlike we've ever seen. And they've targeted King for a long time to disassociate him from. So then we get him in that starter, that, that Black History starter pack. And then we and then sort of leave it to him. <laughs> and they just leave it to that. And then that's it. And, uh, and unfortunately, like many of our, of our, the comparison I often make is even as, as a, as a non-believer admittedly, is that many of us who would, would praise anyone, be it Dr. King, Jesus, Muhammad, anyone else, don't follow and actually study what is being, what they said, what they wrote, what was left from them. We're often getting the versions of these uh, uh, people and important figures uh, that are, again, propagandized to manage uh, and, and uh, ultimately prevent the, 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 you know, the, the justifiable revolution that most of us would really want and that King was advocating. So I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah that, I think. Go ahead and cut y'all off. Yeah. No, I think that was a uh, you know, very great and comprehensive answer. And I think um, there are two things I, I'd like to add. First, that um, black people, um, aided and abetted that misunderstanding, that domestication of King. Because I can remember, I, you know, I grew up in the black nationalist movement in, in Newark where Mary Baraka, somebody clap. And um, <laughs> I should, maybe I should sit amen in the church. <laughs> um, and you know, as um, far as we're concerned, Martin Luther King was a chicken bone preacher and a punk, you know. and. Uh, you remember us saying, I ain't going to let nobody beat on me until I get tired, right? And then you have people in the church who, um, uh, they, um, they glom down to that uh, misunderstanding of his love message. They didn't see the radicality of his love, love message. And, you know, and the black church is historically very um, uh, socially conservative anyway for, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of interesting and uh, understandable reasons. So, you know, that, there was all that, that's always that substratum. But, but I think what's more important is that when King started openly, I mean, he started crit critiquing capitalism as early, publicly as early as 55 in his uh, Paul's letter to American Christian, right, where he really, where he really, uh, where, you know, where he really criticized uh, uh, capitalism in a sermon in 1955, believe it or not. I mean, come on, 55, this young brother was already critiquing capitalism. But he came out, um, you know, like in 66, 67, he started really naming capitalism and critiquing it and deconstructing it and talking about socialism. So when he started the, um, the fight for the, uh, the poor people's campaign and he talked about going to Washington, D.C., uh, a lot of people forget King was talking about shutting the city down. They were going to close all the main uh, exits and entrance into the city. They were going to go in and shut down all the government buildings. He talked about sabotage. Uh, uh, and he, he talked about using the most radical, um, non-human uh, hurting um, uh, uh, tactics to shut down the city. But think about this. If King had, by way of background, there was something called the, 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 the Bonus March um, 
that was in the, uh, that was right before the Great Depression. Real quick, those who have been to World War I were, pra were promised that they'd get a bonus, uh, a financial bonus for their, for their uh, work, uh, I mean for their service in, in the 40s. Well, when the um, the depression started, folks said, we need our money now. The government said, we're not going to give it to you. He said, we're starving, we need our money. Well, uh, you know, uh, veterans, uh, like, you know, 40,000 of them went into D.C. and they, like, took o o over the city. And it's, it's a long story, but it was a very radical thing. People got killed and all that, and that had a lot to do with the start of the, the New Deal. Um, but when you look at it, look at, um, when you contrast King's position King still, even though, you know, 70% of America said he wasn't uh, relevant anymore, he still had great name cachet. He's talking about bringing poor people from all over the country to, to take over the, the, the government and to really to come in Washington, D.C. and take it over. Imagine the pressure that would have put on the government to look at, out for poor people to change, institute policies that would really... Um, uh, help poor people that really fight, would fight against capitalist exploitation and all that. It would have been the most radical thing that ever happened since the American Revolution. So, they had, they, not only did they have to kill him, but they had to kill that radical notion afterward. And the way to do that was to domesticate him and make him into this defanged um, dreamer. So it was really about fighting against the most radical politics of, of Martin Luther King is, is, is um, why they have this ongoing um, domestication of Martin Luther King. And I think that's something that should be kept in mind because that also means that we should go back and study, study that what was it that he was really looking to do that was so dangerous that they had to kill him just two weeks before the campaign started. Sharice, let me ask you a question. Because we've been saying the word radical a lot, right? And I don't want to take for granted that we all know or even share a definition of radical. So help me first of all understand when we talk about radical politics, e even to assess King, what is, what is a radical politics? And to what extent did King fulfill that sort of vision in your estimation? And to what, to what extent does he fall short of that? And if you're an academic, so if, if my framing of the question itself is problematic, feel free to, to push back against that too. Well, I mean, I, I, did, I think it depends on who you mean by we. Broadly conceived, radicalism is historically and contextually specific. Um, and so it really depends on who you ask. So if you ask somebody like me, radicalism must be like anti-capitalist. But beyond that, it must be socialist. Because you see, there's negative and positive aspects of any program. It, you have to demarcate what you're against, but you also have, to, also have to say what you're for. Because fascists, theoretically, are anti-capitalist. Fascists are populist. Fascists are largely working class and petty bourgeois. So if we don't specify what we're against, or if we only specify what we're against but don't say what we stand for, then that also lets us uh, lets whatever message be co-opted quite easily. So, but in a broad, you know, ra everybody always says, you know, radicalism in its denotation or its definition means grasping something at the root. So, to the extent that King was a radical, it was his sometimes it, it was his commitment, right, to a certain degree of to structural transformation. But to me, I wouldn't call King a socialist. I would call him a social democrat, which I think is fine, because he did believe that there was an economic democracy that was possible under the capitalist system, which, mean that, which is to say under this mode of production, which is to say that, and he never, I, in, in the study that I've, I have um, done of King, and I'm not a King scholar like these folks, so they can um, offer a corrective, they could try. But, um, <laughs> He, I don't see him talking about. Hey, over his mic now for when she done. So I'm seeing his face. I don't see him talking about expropriation. Socialism fundamentally requires expropriation. Like people who are at the top don't get to keep what that mean? Oh, okay. a monopoly. Excuse me, a monopoly on wealth. Right. That redistribution is not just about the new wealth generated. It's about fundamentally expropriating the people who hoard wealth, and that's what's going to collapse a particular class structure. But I think where, to, for me, where King 
is most radical and decisive is, is in his critique of white people, right? He worked interracially, but he was very adamant in his critique of white liberalism and of gradualism and of the, uh, the deeply unethical nature of gradualism, right? And this idea that every gay, he says something along the lines of, you know, white liberals will say, any gain that Negroes make, that's enough, right? And they try to dictate and determine the pace by which change happens. And so I think that's something that's misunderstood about King because he believed in interracial organizing and nonviolence as a strategy, right? That he was somehow um, under the thumb of white folks or that he didn't have a critique of, of white liberals. And so I think that that's something that's very, very radical about um, his program. But also he's an internationalist. And an internationalist is somebody who does local organizing with a broader framework of its connectedness to what's happening elsewhere in the world, right? This understanding that, like Malcolm X said, you can't understand what's happening in Mississippi if you don't understand what's happening in the Congo, right? And so internationalism means that what's happening to black people in ghettos in the United States and townships in Johannesburg and favelas in Brazil and garrisons in Jamaica and slums in Haiti are deeply connected. And he had a fundamental, what was then called like a third world consciousness, this idea that, the, that there is a fundamental connectedness beyond, between the oppressed and that what connected them was capitalist exploitation and imperialism. And that is radical because part of the strategy of COINTELPRO that Jared was talking about, but that actually follows from another program called um, Common Form, right? The attack on the Communist Party, I'm not gonna go into that. But part of that strategy was to criminalize internationalism, to make it seem that civil rights was enough whereby King and then subsequent people like Malcolm X, et cetera, et cetera, were struggling for human rights. So I could go on and on, but to me, those are some of the elements of, of a radical consciousness, internationalism, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, and then a critique of the racial regime, even as we understand the sort of necessity of working across sort of racial categories. Oh, I was going to let you, but I want you to just get a quick rejoinder. Yeah, I just want to, real quick, because I, I want to hear from my uh, grad school colleague, Leslie. But thank you for that uh, explanation. That was, I think that was very, very helpful. I'd just like to say that I think um, you made a good <clears throat> argument for him being a, uh, a social democrat. The reason I would argue that he's a, a democratic socialist, other than the fact that he's used the, the, the term, is that um, he did talk about re uh, the redistribution course of uh, good services and wealth um, but um, he, he he also stressed um, democracy right and he wanted to make I mean you know there's market socialism as you know and all that so what he wanted to, to, to change the architecture of society he wanted to change the political e economy but um, the democratic socialists want work within the framework of democracy so that didn't mean that he didn't want to change it, uh, change it radically, but he did want to get involved in, in, uh, in authoritarianism, uh, totalitarianism, or anything like that. What was that? I just said liberal democracy. Okay, we won't. But anyway, that's my, <laughs> that's my argument, okay. that he was a democratic socialist. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to pivot only for time, because I'm, I'm fascinated by some other things that have come up here. I'm going to start with, with you, Leslie Calhoun, because you said a you said a few things that I thought were interesting, and they prompted me to think about some other things. So I have like two to three questions that we can, we can sprinkle around here. The first thing is you talked about Dr. King um, as a pastor, which I think is important, right? And a distinction, he's not just a preacher. He's not even, he's not an evangelist. He's not going around, like, as opposed to, no shade, as opposed to like the Jesse Jackson model, right? Like he's not going church to church. You, yeah, I go church to church the same sermon, right? <laughs> but literally, catch me saying Biden tomorrow. But yeah. there's something different about every Sunday having a message for some, for for a group of people, having a pastor about organizing and leading and tending to people. Yeah. How does that speak to a broader potential understanding of what maybe community looks like, of what radical organizing looks like, and what his broader political project will look like? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly, I mean, that's, that's a part of what I'm 
that's part of what I'm getting at. I mean, uh, you and I had a conversation in the green room about what it means to try to figure out, for me, part of what King is doing is trying to figure out in necessarily practical terms what changes the conditions of the people he cares about and that he cares for as a part of his calling, as a part of his sense of, it, it actually speaks to, to the, the point about having a kind of positive vision mm -hmm. of, of, of what you do want and not, you ha mm -hmm. in order to, you have to get past just no if you're going to actually take care and see to the see to people's actual changing changing circumstances, and I think, for me at least, as I read him, um, as I kind of watch the tra trajectory of his life and ministry, and kind of how he gets how he gets sucked in in the first place uh, to the particular peculiar battles that he ends up fighting, and also what it means, and just for instance, what it means in in the midst of the civil rights struggle to be the one who ends up eulogizing the people who get killed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is pastoral work. Mm -hmm. Preaching eulogies is pastoral work. And how one approaches that with the added strain and stress of feeling some, as, as folks noted, feeling some responsibility for the fact that the people got killed. Yes. So I, I think I understand King is a pastor. I'll say one more thing about that. So part of what pastors do is to lead particular groups of people. I love what you said earlier about, about the community connection. And I'm, I'm sort of, I see this as a part of one of the communities that he was deeply connected to, uh, was always Ebenezer in Atlanta, and then Dexter Avenue while he was still um, in Alabama, when he was still in Montgomery. Part of the, the, part of the energy of pastoral life and ministry, and this is my own reflection on it as someone who is a pastor, is that you don't just get to make commitments for yourself. You don't just get to make commitments to your fam for your family. You don't just get to lead, you're leading people out into wildernesses on the way to some place that you barely see your own self with a sense of responsibility for the folks who have followed you out into this, I mean, this is leadership in general. Um, and so I think I, how I understand, so if we're going out here, it can't just be, I get a holiday after me, right? There has to be some deliverable making your life better for the people who are taking this big risk to be out here. And I think part of how I understand his evolution is that he gets clearer and clearer that the answer to what really makes life pe people's lives better gets more and more complicated. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So it starts out, okay, we're gonna get on these buses. Okay, but now we own these buses. That ain't enough. Desegregation is not enough. And so much so is it not enough that I'm not going to trade desegregation for a continued silence on the war in Vietnam. Because it's just not enough. And I think that's part of how, how he gets, I mean, I, I agree with you, Aubrey, that he was having, I mean, he was having complicated thoughts all along. But he gets bolder and bolder about what he says about yeah, them exactly. as it becomes clearer and clearer that the aims and that the hopes that he has for an ever-expanding beloved community cannot be, you can't get there without, a dis, without more and more disruption of the status quo. Mm -hmm. that's, so that's, I think, and I can see, I mean, again, I am a pastor. If you ever really get serious about the well-being of somebody besides just you and your family, yeah. then your understanding, your politics change. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. they just do. Yeah, yeah. I'm coming back to you again, okay. Pastor. 
and then I'm going to Jared. So get your mind. Loose. And it's for all y'all, but I'm just I'm just telling you the, the, the direction. I'm I'm thinking about August 28, 1963. King gives the most heralded speech, perhaps in human history. And I don't think that's an overstatement. Um, not the best speech, but the most heralded speech. Second. Also misunderstood. And the most misunderstood speech. The second half is the most heralded. Yes. That's yeah. right. Right. That's right. 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 That's very true. His clothes. His, the, really, the clothes, right. Yes, clothes. But when I, well, the reason I'm bringing that speech up, and we can talk about the, the contradictions in the speech, but there's something interesting that happens not on August 28, 1963 for me, but on November 10, 1963, when Malcolm gives message to the grassroots. One of the things Malcolm X does, in direct response to the March on Washington, is to speak about the idea of a of blood, the significance of bloodshed, and, and, and the centrality of revolution being about land, being, involving bloodshed, not about sharing the same toilet as white folk. Mm -hmm. And there was a sentiment at that moment that a true radical tradition and radical movement had to involve bloodshed, not for its own sake, but that, there, that but that we couldn't, but that that nonviolence, not just as a tactic but as an overarching philosophy, as a way of navigating the world, as, a, as an overall way of understanding not just human interaction, but also human possibility. There was an idea that that's incompatible with a radical tradition. How do you, and maybe this isn't just a, a, a pastoral or, 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 or religious question, but it seems to me that King's faith was somehow bound up in his commitment to nonviolence, not just as a tactic. I, I agree. You, you know what I'm saying? But, but, but as something deeper than that. And so part of what I want to know is maybe get some insight into the how and why that. And then as we go around the room, I want to say, is that compatible with a radical tradition to its, to its fulfillment? I see it as a tactic, but the question is, can we get... The strategy. Or, 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 the tactic will be letting people beat you up. The strategy is with the approach. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Exactly. Thank you. So it does it, is, is it overall effective as a strategy? Right, but for King, it's it, it's, it's, it's tactic, it's strategy, and it's also philosophy. It's it's, right. it's, it's, it's a belief that yes. that nonviolence will not just be redemptive for, for for them and for the world, but even for me. Mm -hmm. That nonviolence yes. stops. That just doesn't stop. Uh, it may not stop you from hating me, but it stops me from hating you, and that that is a significant part of my journey as a human being. And and, and that that matters for some reason. So a bunch of people are like that, that stuff don't matter. We just get the land, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get free. Anyway, all that to say, so, yeah. So yeah, I mean. I don't share King's conviction about nonviolence. Well, I don't. I don't. Because I'm just not that idealistic. I mean, I, I, here's what I do think is right about it, though. I think that it's, I, I think that part of what he's getting at It is self-determination too, right? You can't make me hate you. Like you can't, you don't push my buttons. You don't, you don't control, you don't control the deepest, my deepest sensibilities or commitments. And nothing you can do puts you in charge of me in that way. I think that is itself, I'm not, I'm not talking about the radical tradition, but I do think there's something powerful about that the commitment around that. I think, though, as we talk about this trajectory in the fall of 1963, we have to consider and include September 15th mm. and the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and back to this thing about the way that King feels responsible and people hold him somewhat responsible for the death of children in the movement um, is part of what is part of what Mark Malcolm X critiques quite pointedly, but also I think what what King also himself feels really deeply. I mean, he's it's he's tormented by it. It's it's terrible, um, and so then he has to sort of figure out. And what he says in the eulogy is, "I still believe that." The, in the in the redemptive capacity. Now that's where I, he and I depart. I I think, and for me it's theological. I want to believe something different about God 
than it than redemptive suffering and the mm. and the bloodshed of innocence as atonement. That that's a theological. That's where Ken I I part ways with him theologically. That's a whole other panel because yeah, it is. That feels foundational. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's yes, it is. But so I don't I don't want to get too far down that. But uh, but but again, I'll say this again. What I do think is powerful is the notion that my attitude, perspective, and my deepest commitments are not determined by racists. And I don't, and you can't push my buttons. Hmm. And so I think, I think in that way, I mean, I think that's, I, think, I don't think you have to be nonviolent to hold that position. But I do think that's the place from which King was operating where nonviolence was more than strategy and tactic. And that's where he departed from people who were like, yeah, this ain't working, let's do something else. But he believed, it was a faith, it was a, it was a part of how he engaged hope in a hope-filled existence. He believed, he believed love was stronger than hate. He believed that. I'm not sure I do. Right. That's, 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 I'm like, whoo, he's a probably amazing human being. Can I just add? Yeah, 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 and then I'm a Yeah, please. Just really, I just want to add two things really quickly in terms of strategy. 19, the early 1960s is when we see the rise of televisual media. So this is the first time in history that people really have TV sets in their homes. And so strategically, it is very powerful for white folks who don't have a consciousness of white supremacy and white brutality and white terrorism to see children getting water hoses, getting bit by dogs, getting hit in the head with bricks when they're just sitting there existing, right? So that is really important. Like that cannot be underestimated, right? That's a strategy. But I think that... But I think that King fundamentally understood the correlation of forces as well. And this is his critique of particular aspects of black power. You see, sometimes we radicals don't believe our own analysis. If it is that we think that the state and the ruling class has a monopoly on force, right? And we have not strategically built the international connections and relations that we need to fortify some type of guerrilla warfare domestically, then you're gonna die you're gonna die. And to a certain degree, if, if it is that we, you know, we're working in a Fanonian tradition, then the violence is humanizing. And so winning is not necessarily the point. But I think that King fundamentally understood this, right? That white folks have the monopoly on violence, the monopoly on force, the monopoly on state power. And so a violent approach is a fool's errand at that moment. Now, to Jack, I want to you extend that analysis because the King King would say at any moment, though, e even if we could win by, with, through, through armed struggle, that it's not the the approach we're going to take. So again, I just have to admit my bias, not being the a, a King scholar or some leading authority on it. But but the more I've gone back and read King, my bias reads him as saying is emphasizing the tactical flaw as opposed to the strategic flaw. And that's why he kept saying what we often always leave out, nonviolent direct action. Direct action. So he wasn't trying to, it, so he wasn't, so that's the way, so when, even when I went back was reading the showdown for nonviolence essay, which I wish I could still, even though I was just reading it on the train up here, I can't remember it very clearly. But the, the vibe I get from it is he's saying like, I don't want us to go here, but I understand why it might be necessary. And I'm not even necessarily opposed to it because I'm more interested in freedom than I am in adhering to any. So that's just the way I've been reading that, that, he, that there's always that, and even what was already mentioned, what he had been planning for 68. When he's talking about even redistributing the, the rents of poor people back to poor people to fix up their communities, I don't read that as nonviolent. I read that as a direct confrontation that is going to, <laughs> is going to, <laughs> you're talking about people's money, you know? So, so I, can't, I can't, while we're here in Philadelphia, uh, leave out 
a reference to one of my favorite people who recently passed, Russell Maroon Schultz. Wow. And in, in The Implacable, Shit. he wrote one of the best, I think one of the, I can't stop thinking about where his, when he starts talking about what is nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Because his point is, scientifically, the opposite of violence is not nonviolence. That's the absence of violence. The opposite of violence is an equal and opposite reaction. And then when I go back and read King, even though if I, if I remember correctly, Schultz is a little bit critical of King, in there, he, or he questions what King, I can't remember. But, but when I go back, when I start putting it all together in my bias, I hear them saying the same thing. To your point, one is a, is a is, now I want to get the language right, a, 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 a pastor, not just a preacher. And I really appreciated hearing that explanation, by the way. That, um, and one is a, is a Black Panther Party guerrilla revolutionary. But I hear them saying in their own context, in their own language, the same thing and trying to inspire people towards the same thing with the recognition, as Kwame Ture said, the issue of violence or peace is not up to us. Mm -hmm. right. We want, we want freedom. If you let us be free, then okay, then it's peace. <laughs> right. I know that's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm gonna give you a word. Oh, 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 please, okay, grab the mic. Um, we're going to take, start our Q&A. Um, also, you're hearing a lot of names, a lot of amazing ideas. People like the great Russell Maroon Schultz. Uh, his children might be here. Is Russ here? He said he was, okay. Um, Russell Moore Schultz, you hear Dr. King, you hear Malcolm X. All these are in books. <laughs> and as it happens, we sell books at Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books. So, so what I encourage everybody to do, in all sincerity, is, 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 is look into this stuff. Engage these ideas over the course, not just today and tomorrow, but over the next 12 months. So the next time you come, when you come to the seventh annual symposium, our, our conversation will be deeper, it'll be richer, it'll be more informed by this stuff. It also helps us stay open and to continue to have free community education because we don't charge a penny. That promo real oh, quick. Because this just happened to me last semester. A student told me straight up to my face in the classroom, I don't really need your classes. I can learn everything I need to from YouTube. My God. Straight up, this is straight, she was dead serious. And, and my, my exact response was, but everything you see people creating content out of on YouTube, they learn from somebody in a book that they're not properly crediting. So if you don't read and you don't study and you only rely on YouTube, you not only cannot check facts, but you can be led down any, no, any number of different paths. That's it. That's it. I think about Robin Kelly, love, study, struggle. Everybody say love, love. study, Struggle. Exactly. You know, Organize. You thank organize. you. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Uncle Bobby's has a great collection of books on uh, these subjects. I was there and I was a little surprised because, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, to see the, 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 yeah. the breadth, it, not just the light, you know, not, not just the superficial ones that you, you, you see. And also, you know, I've, I've published about 12 articles on King. You might check some of mine out on... Uh, Aubrey Hendricks, you might check some of mine out because I. And your book, man. The, the book, The Politics of Jesus, which is, I mean, it's an incredibly important book. And it, it lays out so much of what we're talking about here. Because that revolutionary politics of Jesus that you lay out is exactly in the Kingian tradition. Yeah, it produces yeah. the Kingian tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Christians Against Christianity pushes back against some of that evangelical green screening that's happening. Oh, I kick ass in that book. Yeah. The, oh. Oh no, man! I was mad as hell. <laughs> oh, we get, we get that, right? But, uh, but anyway, and I'm, you know, I was. Oh, I was saying one thing. Questions. So you, you will have questions. So if you have, is there? We got, we got a mic in the crowd. All right, cool. So if, raise your hand if you got a question. Can I? All right. So just we just want to keep your mic. Go. Ahead. I just want to get people prepped so that they can. All right. We got some organizing to happen to get these questions out. Go ahead. Organize. <laughs> Listen to this sister. She got a lot of nerve, right? <laughs> All right. A couple things. Uh, just real quick. First, pastors, the Latin for shepherd, right? He was a shepherd. I just wanted to deal with it. He definitely was a shepherd. He was looking out for the sheep on, 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 on every level. Before I go to that, I just want to say real quick. One of the reasons I said King was a, a, a democratic socialist because he was in the tradition of the black Christian socialist. Benjamin Mays 
was a democratic socialist. You know, as you know, it was one of his greatest, uh, uh, greatest influences. Mordecai Johnson, who went on to become the first president of, of, of Howard, you know, he was of great influence on, on down the line. But um, other, other thing that's not really known too much in Leslie, I mean, this goes along with what you're saying. King's father tried to get him to be pastor, I mean, get him to, to, uh, to accept the call of ministry for a long time, and he fought against it. <clears throat> but during this summer, uh, the summer I think was between um, uh, graduating from high school and going to college, he went to work in the t tobacco fields in, uh, uh, in Connecticut. Many people don't know that Connecticut is a major uh, tobacco producing state. And he was there with Samuel Du Bois Cook, who went on to become president of Dillard University. And, he's in, 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 uh, Dr. Cook said that it was there when King was in working in those, in those sweltering tobacco fields with migrant workers who were, were damn near starving. It was then when he really heard and accepted um, his call to the ministry. That, and, and, uh, and so qualitatively, that his, he saw his, his call to ministry as struggling, like Jesus said, for the least of these, you know, to take care of the, the, the poor and the hurting. Um, also, he, um, his, his, his whole notion of turning the uh, the nonviolence was sort of a, a, a popular on, on the trajectory of a popular misunderstanding of turning the other cheek um, and I talk about this in the politics of Jesus but essentially as a, and it goes along with what you were saying turning the other cheek was essentially saying when you go back and read it Jesus is telling people who, who are when you are in um, a position where you have a lesser power you know, uh, when, when those who are, who are pressing you have much more power, and, 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 and as you said, it would be a deadly thing to stand against them, then, you know, you turn the other cheek in the sense of to maintain your sense of agency. So if you slap me, and instead of me going, oh, man, turn in like, a, like we used to say back in the street, like a natural man, if you're a man, and say, all right, all right, you got that one. Okay, now catch this one. And that is like you taking agency. Like a woman in South Africa was walking down the street with her kids um, doing apartheid, and a white man spat in her face. And then she said to him, okay, thank you, sir. Now do it to my children. And scared him to death, he turned around and ran down the street. She took the power. So that's a misunderstanding. And also, but the, one other thing that has me thrown is that Jesus does talk about loving your enemy. And I think that's what King was really trying to work through. I, you know, I ain't exactly there, you know, but, uh, you know, I think that he was really trying to be, in that sense, he was really along the line of the gospel, which is not really practical at all times, but he was, but he was really trying, you know, more than anything, because King was very, very self-sacrificial. It's almost like he took personal responsibility for um for for the suffering of the of the people that, that's not for, for everybody but su summarizing what I'm saying is that King was he took some for many of us un impractical and unrealistic positions because he was it's almost like he was trying to hew to the letter of uh of the gospel sayings of, of, of Jesus uh in in the in in community but that's dangerous for everybody to try to follow when you're fighting evil. By the way, he did not say do not resist evil. I talk about that in the book, so that's a mistranslation. He's saying do not violently resist evil when you're in a subordinate uh, position. I think that's so important for us to try to understand. It sounds tactical to some extent. And, that's actually... and strategic. He was very strategic about it, like you said. Like... So let's, let's, let's take some questions from the audience. Let's take some questions from the audience. I think we're going to go here, and then we're going to go to the sister right here in the green, and then my brother right here. I see you in the middle there, yeah? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you for... Uh, I'm not, is that mic? Yeah. We're going to get a different mic. And everybody, just as you think about your question, just try to keep the questions as brief as possible. I'll just pass this. Yeah. Good afternoon. And thank you to the esteemed panel. Um, I'm feeling kind of old, and I know I'm not the oldest by any means here, but I, I think about the interview that Dr. King gave May 8, 1967, where out of his own mouth he, he pretty much said, 
you know, the reason that he was going for the nonviolence tack was he had a moral obligation first, but he also said it wasn't practical to get jumpy. We don't have enough guns. We don't have the, the power being like 11% of the population to fight this enemy. I, I think of a pastor, I think of a shepherd, I think of a flock, and I think of the shepherd not really trying to engage the wolf. You'd rather move the flock to safer grounds than fight the wolf or the wolf pack or, or whatever, unless it's absolutely necessary. I'd like to ask you, the panel, to, to, to speak to what Dr. King said also in that May 8th interview, 1967, where he said something to the effect, my dream of 1963 in many ways, I view now as a nightmare. Yeah, let's, let's, let's we kind of leave that out. Let, let's, let's pick up with that. And, and I think it speaks to, and I want you to answer this brother's question directly because it speaks to this question of King's later years. You know, there's a lot of analysis that says that King has uh, shifted uh, his, that sermon that was in his pocket before he died in April of 68. Why, why America is going to hell. May go to hell, excuse me. May go to hell. He was speculative. Yes. Um, <laughs> perhaps. Um, he, had, he, he had seemed to have lost faith in the kind of, re, not the, not the, at, the, at the deepest spiritual levels, but the, he, had, he had lost some faith in the possible, redemptive possibility of the white folk. Right. You know, he, he didn't have the same sort of optimism or hope in, in this thing anymore. Um, does that make us think of, uh, what do you all make of King? Uh, Jerry, I want to start with you. And, and, and if someone else wants to jump in, you can. Yeah. I just think, I just think that that speaks to, the, to the, well, the propaganda that we've been fed, that, that erases that part of his analysis and where he was headed. And so I think you raise a very important point. Well, he, yeah, well, he was there, but I also think he was headed, you know, I, but that's, you know, we, but, but the point is that we are not meant to pick up, uh, and I always think about the fifth tenet of the, counter, of the counterintelligence program, which spoke specifically about making sure black youth are not introduced to these radical ideas. And I think, so uh, again, when I went to the monument in DC and I only see one quote from post 66, I mean, they totally erased him. That, that, that whole analysis where he was, becoming more and more critical. He said white folks uh, uh, are more, he said the white liberals are more happy to walk off with our aggressors than they are to help us. He said, he said the, 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 the first, the, the civil rights struggle he had been engaged in to that point had been like rushing the football to the 50 yard line and claiming touchdown. I mean, he had all of these, he was, he was really reassessing, and I think to the point you're all raising, that he was really reassessing what he had been, particularly after those summers in Chicago again, where he's confronted, he's like, damn, up here, they just as bad as they are. Excuse my language, sorry, I forgot to forgive me. Forgive me. Um, he's, you know, they're just as bad up here as they are down there. We need maybe another approach. We need to, and, and all of the, the allusions to him moving towards Malcolm, the, the people they had in common, putting, you know, performing as intermediaries, Malcolm would tend to go meet with him. King's ever-evolving internationalism and anti-capitalism, trying to find that language, I think, that he was still working with, trying to work out, again, to, to balance his, his religious beliefs and his clearly evolving radical political beliefs. Um, so yeah, and that's why we're not meant to, to he, we're, we're meant to bring him back to I Have a Dream, which is itself not considered as radical as it really was at, at that time. Like, it, that, that speech is, I think, maybe if I understood you all correctly, misunderstood by undercutting its still valuable content, uh, even as he got more, I think, overtly radical as he got older, or, or continued on, so. I actually, part of what I just thought as we're talking about, and it's kind of everything we, all the way around from where we started, is the, um, the revolutionary capacity of The, the black church as an institution could take up the radical vision of King and because the institution belongs to black people, it could 
if you had a if you didn't just do the the king ver the dream version of king with the strategy I mean, with the structure of the institutional life, which reminds me of the thing you talked about earlier about the preservation of King, King's own formation in community in various institutions and in connection with various institutions, you have to take the radical out because by the time King dies and is martyred in a, in a quite literal sense, People who didn't like him start to feel connected to him. People who were skeptical even within black communities start to claim him. If they claim the radical king and have some institutional organizational life to support it, the capacity to, the, the capacity to call attention in the United States, it's like hard to imagine even 60 years later, 60, 50, 55 years later, how much could be done if you place all of the resources and the ideas together? That explains why you don't, why people don't want that to happen. And so some of it is to muddy the waters of who King is so that we're all sitting around saying, well, you can say anything about King. He's, you can green screen King and actually keep people from claiming any kind, and in a way that is very much like Jesus. I mean, Aubrey, uh, very pointedly and famously, has called, in at least two books, called us to account about the way Christianity and Christianities don't take Jesus seriously at all. Because if they did, then you take poor people seriously. The point you do that with King or Jesus, you upend this entire project. Three sentences. Three sentences. It speaks to King understanding the intransigence of racism, but also capitalism. I think he just got very demoralized. He realized this capitalist edifice is much, much uh, more terrible, much more demonic, and much more powerful than he than he realized. That, that, that's an important point. That, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Where we at? Where uh, we yeah. Up? Peace, y'all. Uh, thanks for uh, having this event, and just wanted to read this quote real quick before I jump to my question. King says in April fourth, nineteen sixty-seven, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world my own government, I cannot be silent. Now, there's an organization in D.C. Did everybody and, hear that? Did everyone hear that? Okay. Solid, great. Up, we have some sound issues up here. I don't see it. Oh, no, I can project, definitely. There's an organization in D.C., their name is PACA, and at the end of their listserv in their email, it talks about the famous Kwame Ture quote that reinforces that uh, revolutionaries are not revolutionary by themselves. They are a part of an organization. And I want to to ask y'all to speak about the importance of Martin Luther King being a part of an organization. Thanks. Okay, no, that, that's a great question. The quote from April 4th, 1967, which is at Riverside, it's Riverside Church, that is the speech, not the first moment, but the, the most noted uh, sort of formal rejection, right, of the Vietnam War, beyond Vietnam, beyond the silence, I believe. Um, time to break the silence, thank you. Um, and so that's an important moment. Right, and in that analysis, he's not only denouncing the war, but he's engaging in a, in a critique of U.S. both foreign, domestic, and foreign policy, and the relationship between those two things. Saying we got to go over there to fight wars, and we can't live on the same block here. Right, all that's part of the analysis. I just want to give that context for people who don't know the speech. Um, but then you're asking, and I'm also restating it for folk who couldn't hear. You're, 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 this thing about the United States being a I'm sorry, no. This thing about the importance of joining organizations and being part of having an organizational commitment is also central to your question, correct? So, um, 
thank you for that. Um, that, it, that actually is part of what I was speaking to about the church as an institution. Um, and then King himself was part of several various organizations, and, including the groups and communities that helped to form his consciousness around this in the first place. I think all of that is um, really important. And in terms of that speech in, in 1967, um, I think the, to me, at least as I've read it over time, the beyond in Beyond Vietnam is the piece that's so important that's often ignored. The speech isn't fundamentally just about the war. It's about all of the conditions that the war makes clear. It, it's beyond, it's beyond Vietnam. He's, he, it is a, it's a statement about the thoroughness of um, the demonic from a spiritual standpoint, this the evil that the United States is a purveyor of. One more comment about organizations. The other side of that is that organizations are a two-edged sword because when the time came for him to break silence around Vietnam, it was the institutions that he was part of, particularly SCLC and the other folks who were in LCLC who could see uh, the potential for actually realizing some of the aims that they had at that in that organization through the Johnson administration who asked him specifically and who opposed his opposition to the war because of the way that it would take them out of the room with Lyndon Johnson in the way that they had been in the room with him before. It, these things are complicated um, and I think that complexity is also why he, he became um, uh, why his vision was not as maybe sunny as it had been earlier in his life. The, com the, the way that evil found a way around, you know, you, you feel like you've got a straight, you're on a straight line to things getting better and then evil finds a way to go around, I think is part of how you can almost see him shaking his head like, dang. Well, so I think I'll, I'll speak to, so it's not only important to join an organization, in my perspective, it's important to join a revolutionary organization and also to contribute to that organization and to contribute to the longevity of that organization. Too often, personal, individualized experience in organizations are weaponized to collapse the whole organization. And that is um, how liberalism creeps into our formations. And so I think I often talk about the relationship between ethics, epistemology, and politics. And all three are important for joining an organization. Ethics is, a, is about what we value, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others, and then how we relate to the world around us. So being an organization is an ethical commitment. Epistemology has to do with how we understand the world, how we come to justify those understandings and beliefs, and then how we um, inhabit what we understand. And so being an organization moves us toward a collective understanding of the world and challenges the hegemonic or the dominant or reigning beliefs about the world. Because fundamentally, we have to, to move toward whatever it is that we're imagining. We have to unthink a lot of what we're taught, what Carter G. Woodson calls miseducation, right? And then politics is simply, what is to be done? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? How are we going to challenge power in our economic, um, you know, political and social relations? And how do we do that collectively? And so I think that being part of an organization is about, um, there is no mass movement that's possible without some sort of container. So now we hear a lot of talk about like horizontalism and there's a lot of, a lot of I think, necessary talk about the, the contradictions that pervade organizations or the, the experiences of, let's say, abuse or the negative experience of being in an organization. But every single organization is gonna have contradictions because we live in a, a capitalist settler colonial, in this space, capitalist settler colonial racist society, any organization that doesn't have contradictions is a CIA front, period. <laughs> and so the point is to work through those contradictions, is to, is to be alongside people you don't necessarily like. Comrades are not friends. It's to, it's to fail a lot and to find productivity in those L's. You're gonna take a lot of them if you're on the left. And it's to me to 
practice keeping something together when it's hard, right? And so, so to me, I think that King fundamentally understood. So, for example, so there was a point when Jack Odell, I have this book here um, about, oops, about this man named Jack Odell who was really, really important to King's ideological development. And essentially what happened, I think in 1962 or 63, King nominated him for a position in SCLC. But because he had belonged to the communist organization, he was targeted by the FBI. And Odell made the decision to not take that position. And King basically supported that decision. He talks about that sacrifice of Odell not taking that position for the betterment of the organization. And being in an organization teaches us that type of self-sacrifice, which one might call courage, the willingness of putting oneself in danger for another. And I think King understood all of those things. And I think that that is why we need to join, contribute to, and work to sustain organizations. I think we got time for maybe two questions if we move expeditiously. Um, we'll take this sister right here. Who else had their hand up? You know what? Okay, so I misspoke. So we got four questions. We're going to take them quickly. I'm going to ask one panelist to answer each of these questions. Okay. We're going to go this so sister this here, be... then this brother here. I just want to make sure so nobody. Uh, I'm going to. I'll take them one by one because I'm... four might be too many. I'm going to take the last two, okay. two together. We're we'll going to here, then here. Uh, there was a, a, a gentleman with the. Uh, yeah, I, 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 this is part of that, that L we were just talking about organization. Um, everybody can't get these, but we, we, we'll get here, here. There was a gentleman with a red hoodie I thought I saw. Maybe he might be, yeah, right back there. And then the last one will be the sister the day before her Founders Day. Thank you all so much for being here. This can be directed at Dr. Callahan. Um, you, you mentioned that desegregation isn't enough. And I understand that there does have to be a class analysis because too often integration means um, integrating black and white people without understanding the actual impact on the people. So can you explain more as to why desegregation isn't enough? Dr. Callahan, um, Dr. Leslie? Oh, so Dr. Oh, I'm sorry. Leslie? No, no, I, 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 no, no, if it was directed to somebody, they can answer it. I didn't hear who it was directed for. I didn't hear that. I apologize. No, it's for, it's, it's for you. Can you state the question? Yeah. Let me count. Let me count the ways. Uh, so, so I actually think, I, I think that, I think maybe the most direct answer to that is black people's lives in 2023, where the the economic, the power, like, like a few people get things, but we are not all right. And I think that the and I think that was already clear to King by 1968 that and and it speaks to the point that you made about how King, as he traveled in the Northeast, experiences in Chicago and elsewhere, making clear to him that while the nature of white supremacist power was different in different places, the danger of it and the the um, the human cost of it was the same. Like, it was clear that just getting on the bus was not going to do it, that just being able to eat in the restaurant was not going to do it. He famously said, you know, you can't afford a hamburger. Um, I think, I think, I think, and I think where we live and as we live right now, where there is relatively little, um, segregation by law, but quite a lot of de facto segregation. Um, and, you know, the fact that you can look at a person's zip code and see what their economic prospects are going to be. And you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to see pictures of the neighborhood to know who lives there. Um, so I think, I think we, I'll say one more thing about this. How important it is for us to take the realities of white supremacy is present in the the pretend battle against CRT. Like, don't tell us this story. We don't want to even hear the history. It just shows you how important it is that we take seriously, that we take seriously the role that white supremacy plays beyond, again, whether one legally can go into a restaurant.
How you living? Um, I've been talking with my students around public versus personal responsibility in regards to community, but there seems to be like a full embrace of like individualism a little bit more and more. So I appreciated when y'all talked around um, getting to understand your community needs, you, getting to understand your community needs outside of simply providing for family will change your politic inherently. So that was refreshing. So thank you. I forget who said that. So my question is, what does it look like for you to put community at the forefront again so we can manage our immediate condition until the government gets it together? What does it mean for us to take community seriously and engage community so that we can... Yeah, what does it look like for you? So what does it, what does it look like? You said, yeah. so as opposed to individualism, yeah. so that we can build something you said, until the government gets yeah. itself together. I, I, I might put, I might have thrown away that last piece, but... But but um, no but I'm, I'm half I'm half kidding but but so what does individualism look like what does community look like? I'm sorry what does community look like what is organ what is organized organizing for a community in the context of community as opposed to individualism look like to you all I can't get everybody to answer that but anybody want to take that go ahead you know um, it's a good question but throughout most of human history there was no sense of individualism um, people got their their uh, their honor they got their identity through the community um, focus on uh, the common good, and if we reorient ourselves, well, let, well let's just talk about uh, about church, the gospel. I mean, in, in the Bible. There's no word in in uh, in, in, in biblical Hebrew for um, individual. It's always the the people. Um, so if we focus, if we reorient our, our ourselves, um, King talked about a revolution of values where we are, where our main concern is the common good. You know, looking out for our neighbors because if we struggle for for uh, looking out for our neighbors and for the least of these, then the society will be, will, will be healthy. It really does come down to a, a reorientation of, 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 of values, um, meaning, and, and on, the, on the ground level, that means, you know, we start seeing our neighborhood as a community, not just some place that we, we, we live. And we start dealing with community um, in, institutions, right? Um, we used to have a lot more of those back in the day. Um, it, also, it also means that we, <clears throat> that we elect officials who have that orientation, but we also um, pressure uh, other officials to uh, enact policies that are about the, the good of the community and not just about and not and not just uh, catering to to a particular class or uh, or from an individualistic uh, perspective. So, in summary. It really comes down to trying to change, to have a revolution of values, because everything will come up from that. And we can, and that can be done in the church, um, to speak of the church, because that really is the basis of the Bible. It's about, uh, the, the, the most important ethic of the Bible is justice. They don't teach that, but that shows up more than anything else in the, um, and any other ethic. Uh, and so that's, that's the way I think we really can um, make make a difference, and since we have these churches, if we could really change some of them, I wish everybody was like my sister, uh, Reverend uh, Callahan. Uh, but if we could change some of these preachers, we could get them to come into you know the 21st century. If we could get them to to stop being concerned about uh, institutional maintenance and start being concerned about the community writ large, I think strategically that is the best way. That's one of the better ways for us to make a big change. We're going to take these last two questions together because we, we need to be wrap, landing this plane in the next couple of minutes, next three, hopefully. Uh, we're going to go right here to my brother right here and then my sister right here. Okay, I, I want oh, to tri oh. uh, tribute to the, the socialist who was at the March on Washington in 63 was A. Philip Randolph. Uh, the school name for him in Philadelphia is like 200 others. They do not have a functioning library. So it's pretty radical what the school district has done to close 95% of our school libraries. And if, you know, if people want to join with that effort, you know, go to the school board meetings and tell them and welcome your help with that. Okay, so that's a very concrete ask. The A. Philip Randolph, uh, a central figure in our struggle, school named after him in this district and it does not have a library that that there's so many layers of analysis we can add to that in terms of even sort of how the, the old Chris Rock joke about what MLK Boulevard looks like 
there's something to be said about what institutions that are named after our people, what happens to them and what they represent, but there's a very fundamental problem here, or a more direct, urgent problem, which is that we don't have a library, right, in the school. So someone's asking what, can we, what we can do about that. That feels like a question, um, I don't know if, I don't know if this, that's you know, a panel question, particularly because a lot of them aren't, aren't Philadelphia. I think Leslie, Leslie's the only one up here who's a Philadelphian. Uh, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe we can think through and strategize around that. Some other organizations to think through uh, would be the, uh, th there's a radical teacher network here in Philadelphia. There is a Philadelphia Student Union here in Philadelphia. Uh, what are some other radical educational organizations here that would be helpful for this? Black Lives Matter in school. What else? Uh, right, for sure, going to the board. I I'm just thinking who the who to get to that board is and what the ask is going to be and how we can help organize and think through this, I think is incredibly important. Um, because Uncle Bobby's whoever, we can, we can donate to, to, to the school, but there's a fundamental question here about, about it having a library and why it doesn't. And it's not just libraries. You go to Oberlin High School, I mean, they went 30 years without water fountains. You know, I mean, these, these are fundamental problems. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 so I, mean, I want to I take that question, I take that question seriously. Um, and, and, and that's something maybe even as you all, as we're wrapping up, people who have answers to that question, because there's a lot of educators in here, a lot of educational activists in here who can help us get to that answer. Um, our last question is right here. We're going to get that mic, though. Hello. Good evening, and thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Regarding our current political, social, and economic um, environment now in 2023, how would Dr. King and Malcolm X respond to their philosophies regarding integration and separation? Wow. So I'm going to use my, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in fact, yeah, I, I was gonna say maybe it's an opportunity for everybody to take, to, to take a stab. This is the last thing. Maybe if, if everybody could do like 30 seconds, that might not be helpful. So um, you, you actually just take this on. This is a great question. Yeah, you, I, take I don't, so I don't, I don't mean this to be dismissive, but I, I don't know that it's necessarily useful to speculate on what either King or Malcolm would say today. What I would do is sort of study their work in their particular historical moment and see what they said about that time and think alongside them in terms of like what is to be done. Because we can't ventriloquize them, they did. And, you know, RIP. But, you know, and then again, because of what Jared was talking about and everybody in the panel, there's just so much personal investment in what they would or would not say that it's not, what I will say is, in his time, right, King was deeply concerned about war. He was deeply concerned about imperialism. He was deeply concerned about increasing and entrenched impover uh, impoverishment, structural unemployment, um, and all of the things that we face today, right? Neocolonialism, um, and the list goes on. And so how do we take those concerns then and understand like, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, but like what is our responsibility and what is our historical ta um, task to address those particular issues? So that's probably how I'll respond to that. If I can, I'll just add very quickly that um, I, was t I, I very much agree with what Sharice just said in terms of uh, we shouldn't try to interpret and, and project because that's just snitching on our own biases. but. But I was very tempted to say the first thing they would say is they would go to all of these pundits out here speaking on behalf of them and say, give me the mic back. <laughs> and a lot of these spokespeople would have to run for the hills uh, because in his lifetime, for instance, King was very critical of Andy Young's position on capitalism. And yet Andy Young, speaking on behalf of King for all these many decades, is running amok with the black capitalism. And one of the reasons we get so much of this individualism in our classroom is because there's a whole punditry that's been propped up, platformed, well algorithmed and supported with advertisement to promote this idea that, that, that versions of black capitalism, black entrepreneurialism, uh, uh, individual podcasts, all that kind of stuff, that's the revolution. Uh, I've even had little arguments with artist friends of mine about, my, well, my song is my contribution to the struggle. 
Well, I think we need a little bit more than that. I mean, I, you know, because if I said as an academic, my article was, the, that's my contribution. I mean, I would rightly be called to the carpet for that. So I think, you know, anyway, so that, I, I'll just leave with that joke. They would say, give me my mic back. I'm going to give Obi as we reach the benediction. I sort of disagree. I think King would be saying the same thing now that he was saying then. Um, because, uh, you know, these, the, the, the evils that he stood against and that he identified, that he died fighting, they still exist uh, almost, as, almost to, the, some bit to a, greater, a greater degree. So I think he would, be, uh, he would be saying, now, would there be some different inflections? Yeah, of course, because the time has changed, but the, his core message, I think, was, was still, uh, will still stand and resonate more now than it did then in its, in its radicality. It's just my, my opinion. And, and I don't think those two things contradict each other, actually. I think if we read alongside King and read his work closely and allow his analysis at the moment to inform today, we arrive probably at the same place that you're saying we arrive if we were, if, you know what I mean, if we were able to somehow, with the kind of hypothetical counterfactual thing, you know, to bring him alive and ask him. I think we end up in the same place because I think, his, I think there's a certain kind of intellectual and political consistency with King that allows us to, to, to take that. I'm going to actually give you, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, please. Here's the thing. I, I, I have no idea what King would say exactly, um, but one of the things that I do take from his life, um, I, I find it regrettable that his life was cut short because he actually was evolving in his thinking. And I, I think one thing we could be doing that would be helpful is to stay open and continue to evolve, to be, to be responsive to the ways in which our time, like the basics might be similar, but our time is calling for us to pay attention to additional voices, additional experiences. Um, and the most important thing, I think, from my perspective, is for us not to allow our notions of freedom and justice to ossify and not to pick a time and say, okay, this is what freedom and justice are forever. Because what I find is that when we do that, we fail to take seriously the emerging concerns or the, the growing amplification of concerns um, in our own time. I think we've got to be paying better attention to folks who are saying us too um, in our own time. And I think in that way, I think it lives out what you're talking, which is to say, what was he doing and, and how, what can we learn from the way he did when he was doing it to part of what we can learn is not to stop growing after we get a prize. That's my last. <laughs> Family, this has been one of the most rich, yeah, he ready to go too. He wanted a, one of the most rich and engaging and thoughtful uh, discussions on Martin Luther King that I've heard and certainly that we've even had just in, in our short time here doing these symposiums. Um, I'm so honored that you all said yes. Um, sincerely, it means a lot. And I'm so grateful to you all for coming. So again, I would just ask you, uh, let me say one more thing, because Obi said something that I, uh, I'm grateful for. He said, no, I do so much. And I do a lot, but much of what I do is because I have so much support. So I want to thank the staff at Uncle Bobby's, every single person out there, Avisa, Justin, who else is back there? I can't see with the mask. I apologize. I can't see from the mask. But Three. Th there you go for, for, for making this happen. They're the ones who make this happen. They're the ones who make sure the books that y'all going to line up and buy are, are, are set up out there. They're the ones who make sure the stores open every day. They make sure the website is up. And I just want to thank you all immensely for everything that you do. Um, and everybody, again, Uncle Bobby's, we're open seven days a week.
Make sure you stop by the store. Of course, we got stuff in the hallway, but we also got a store right at Germantown Avenue, right at Germantown and Church. You can get yourself some coffee, get yourself a latte, check out our amazing children's book section. Every single day of the week, we're here, and we'll continue to do live author events. If, you, if you're from out of town, go to UncleBobbies.com. We have apparel, we have books, we have everything you need. And we'll be back here again for an author event next month, and we also will have a symposium in May. It's the Malcolm X 6th Annual Symposium, so make sure you come and bring a friend, all right? Thank you all, and enjoy the rest of your day. Peace.